welcome welcome to this session uh, i see uh, eight participants so i propose we wait a little bit because the other session are not yet uh, finished so we will start soon i see already four people joining hi if you're there, you're welcome to introduce yourself in the chat. You, you can share your name, where you're from. If you want to share your LinkedIn or a, a Twitter handle, do that. Feel free to introduce yourself to each other. I, I will start myself posting something. You can use the chat on the right side. Ici Olivier, Julien, Alexandre, Basileios, I hope I, I pronounce properly your name. <coughs> okay, I see the, the preview session is still uh, live. So I propose well, we will wait additional some additional minutes before starting. Okay, yes. Okay, so people from France, Belgium. By the way, Luca, you can also um, see the, the people in the session and we you can have the overview of uh, at least uh, where they are coming from, their company and their uh, title. Nice. Yes, everyone that is joining, feel free to use the chat uh, to share information. It's it's your free space for interact. Use the chat as as uh, it pleases you. We will use also the Q and A. I will tell you more later. Uh, but we will use the Q and A tab uh, to ask questions, and I will answer all the questions at the end. So the preview session is almost uh, finished. I hear my colleague thanking the people. So hi, Julian, hi, Alex. Uh, while we wait, I'm also curious, uh, are you already experienced with the complexity? Do you know the theory, some theory? Have you already tried some practice related to complexity? Feel free to let me know via the chat. Welcome to the new joiners. We are waiting to start again. Feel free to introduce yourself in the chat. Share your Twitter or LinkedIn handle with the, with the others. We may expect additional people because I think the session is officially closed on the other side. Yeah, let's wait a little more. I think I will still some some more time in the end. I will take some more time in the end, given that we have a buffer. But let's wait a little more. No, nope. no problem. Welcome everyone. I hope you are enjoying uh, the conference already and you're having fun. 
this is the session about the human complexity just to let you know the train is leaving the station soon so be sure you jump on the right coat <laughs> just joking okay i will let the other session the presentation of the other session and then i propose we start uh, our session okay luca yes sir. give give me the go Should I start, Benoit, now? Uh, yeah, we will start. So so um, thank you, Luca, to be there. So uh, it's, it's really great. Huh? So it's an agile co conference. So it was uh, quite uh, normal to, to speak about complexity, and it will be done thanks to Luca. So I let the floor to you, Luca. And if you need me, don't hesitate to ask uh, for assistance. Thank you very much, Benoit. So today I would like to talk about uh, uh, human complexity. And uh, uh, specifically, I will talk about and I will introduce a few practices that I think will be interesting and useful uh, for technical people, software developers, uh, tester, but also for product people, as well as uh, team facilitators and managers and leaders. There is some information that is useful uh, for them to Feel free to use the chat to interact uh, among yourself during the session to connect, to network with each other. If you have questions, please post every question in the Q&A and also upvote the questions that you like more. So I will use the limited time starting with the questions that have uh, more votes. Now, A little about uh, uh, myself. I started uh, to learn and uh, practice Agile around uh, 2001 together with a small group of uh, people. At that time, you know, the focus was primarily on technical practices, then uh, team practices, and then product related practices. A few years later, around 2004, uh, we started to realize that all those practices were working quite well. We were starting to invest the time in learning more about Agile, and we were teaching Agile to our organizations. And so these questions came to us. What are the foundations of Agile? Why Agile works? Is this about hugging trees, singing songs, and colorful post-it, or is there something more, something scientific that underpin and explain why Agile works? So it has been in uh, uh, 2004 when Joseph Perling, during a keynote speech, introduced the concept of a complexity science in order to explain why Agile works. He started giving an high level overview of the uh, theory. You know, uh, people uh, in software development and in digital product development facing problems that cannot be tackled using traditional deterministic approach. Problems where reductionism doesn't work. A network of agents highly interconnected that interact in a way that is non-linear. So a small action can create a disproportional uh, reaction and uh, a ripple effect. And all these made things less predictable. So we understood that Agile was about dealing with that increased degree of uncertainty and unpredictability in a way that was uh, effective. Another idea at the time that became popular is uh, the idea to move from the metaphor of mechanical organization to the metaphor of organization as a living organism. So this was an high level pitch to explain why Agile. And so then we started to look at the literature around. And guess what happened? 
a lot of people start to focus on an algorithmic and mathematical uh, description of complex system and start to use simulation. They will start to thinking, oh, if we set our goal up front and then we run some simulation and we define a set of rules that we can impose on the system, maybe we can create a repeatable pattern that would lead us to our predefined goal. You see what's happening here? We are start to use in the language of complexity to go back to the uh, traditional deterministic pre-agile approach of upfront planning and predefined goals. Or people were, yes, talking about organization as a living organism an organism that have need and desire. And people were trying to use those needs and those desire to orient uh, an organization as if it could be uh, completely controlled. Well, it was a few years later when I joined the uh, Ferrari Formula One team. And that was my uh, first experience when I fully faced the main implication of complexity in my work. And where I started to see that beyond those uh, complex models where the agents are uh, ant, termite, bees, hives, or animals, there is a human element of, to that that is unique. So I joined the Ferrari Formula One racing team, and uh, you must know that the car is made up of several 10,000 of parts. Top teams that are fighting for the championship, they achieve their competitive advantage by the way that all those parts come together, the synergy between the different parts and the trade-off that are set between the parts. Imagine several tens of thousands of parts and the people that work on those parts and the departments and the need for them to collaborate closely in order to develop the synergy of those parts. This is social complexity in action. And then I was also tasked with the paradoxical challenge of a speed up software development while making it at the same time more reliable. Paradox is another element of complexity. But as I tell you before, we are really talking now about human complexity. There are some quality of human beings that make human complexity different from mathematical complexity, biological or animal complexity. We are not ant, nor we are algorithm. So what it is about that that is different? Well, there is some element of human that is completely different to ants or animals. First of all, we have identity, uniqueness, and the heterogeneity. You may have heard the, uh, the sentence uh, that is treat your server, your computer server, not as a pet, but as a cattle. Well, when you are dealing with the human being, you have to instead to, to recognize the uniqueness of every human being. So when we apply complexity in our workplace, to our team, to our department, to our organization, human complexity is really what we are interested into. A complexity that someone calls social complexity or anthro complexity that recognize the uniqueness of human being. We also have intentionality. What does it mean? It means that we are driven by more than instincts, pain or pleasure, needs or desire. You know, we are driven by our beliefs and values, our emotions and sentiments, our intuition. And a lot of the time we are driven by our irrationality. And we have free will and spontaneity. And then our intelligence. Yes, many animals are intelligent and biological systems learn too. But on top of that, we human can create a new knowledge. We have a creativity and we have the ability to share knowledge uh, through language and symbolism. So you see how 
uh, when we look at our day-to-day -day work in software development and digital product development, what we really want to look at is human complexity. Well, since 2004, I spent a lot of time reading around to try to find practical application of complexity, and I've been a complexity practitioner. And during this time, I have identified, looking at the many uh, lit available literature, uh, a lot of different practices that more or less are organized in three broader regions, at least the practices that I found around. The first region, is based on the idea that we human beings are complex. And so uh, in this region, there are all the practices that are about the teams and human self-organization. The second region is about the work that we do that may be co complex. And so in this region, there are a few practices that are about assessing the degree of complexity of the work that we are doing in that moment and adapting our way of working to fit that degree of complexity. And then the third region is about the whole organization, the way we look at organization and the way that we think about how organization work. And this is where you have agility level, uh, organization level agility and anti-fragility. All the practices that I have uh, found and discovered uh, are around those three regions. Now, Let's talk about uh, human self-organization. And please uh, consider human. It's a special type of self-organization. Uh, first of all, it's ongoing because we human beings uh, have a social nature. So we are constantly interacting with each other. In our team, we are talking with uh, uh, other co-workers and software developers uh, or with customers and clients. We have a lot of uh, local interactions and all these local interactions come together and in the present moment create population-wide pattern. Think of a, about a, a spontaneous chorus or a tension that comes from a merger or a community that is building. These population-wide patterns are not like a clock that you can take it apart and study piece by piece and understand how it works. These population-wide patterns are more like a cloud. You cannot dissect a cloud in order to understand how it works. A cloud is constantly evolving and changing, and you need to try to understand it looking at it as a whole. Now, what can we do with the human self-organization then from a practical point of view? What does it mean in our day-to-day -day work? Well, first we need to understand how it works. A weather system or a forest are example of self-organizing complex systems. And think about the forest. You can jump on a bike, take a ride through the forest one morning, and it's a beautiful morning, blue sky, sun, great weather. But the next morning, just the next morning, there could be wildfire everywhere in the same forest. What is the lesson there? The lesson is that self-organization left unattended can go either way. What we really want to do with self-organization is, is to try to direct and influence self-organization away from outcomes that are detrimental for our team, our department, our organization, and try to direct self-organization toward outcomes that we think instead are beneficial to us. Well, beware that, uh, uh, yes, the manifesto of software development introduced self-organization and self-organizing team since the very beginning, but Human self-organization is a little different from self-organization as in the uh, Agile Manifesto. Indeed, uh, recently, a uh, Scrum Guide uh, replaced self-organization with self-management. Really, the uh, Agile Manifesto and Scrum refer to self-management. The interesting thing is that human self-organization is a prerequisite 
for self-management. So that's how the two are connected. Joseph Perlin uh, described the broader theory in order to help us uh, deal and take advantage uh, of self-organization. Now, I work in a lot of different companies, small company, large company, startup, and traditional successful company. And in many traditional medium-large companies, I noticed the assumptions and practices that are well established that uh, lead to a way of doing things that hinder and frustrate the spontaneous self-organization. So when you frustrate and obstaculate self-organization, you prevent the possibility of exploiting the potential of self-organization. What you want to do is to allow self-organization to happen so that you can take advantage of it. And so uh, Joseph Perlin described the prerequisite to self-organization, extending the model from Glendo Young uh, about uh, a prerequisite to human self-organization. You need the critical mass of people, at least three people, and the more the better. You need diversity, cognitive diversity, and allow dissent people to freely express different opinion and disagree openly. You need an environment, and not just the physical environment, an emotional environment, a virtual environment and time that lead to people enough room for movement but at the same time, an environment that is small enough so that people cannot avoid each other and ignore each other. And then you need to let people do it. You need to allow people uh, some degree of autonomy. And this is important uh, so for leaders and managers to spot if you see uh, that the prerequisites to self-organization are there, and if not, to intervene in order to make sure that those prerequisites are in place. Only when those prerequisites are in place, you will be able to take advantage of the potential of self-organization. And then uh, in the work of Joseph Perlin, he described a set of uh, uh, control knobs, things that you can tweak, uh, as I mentioned to you before, in order to try to influence and orient self-organization toward outcomes that are beneficial for you and that are not detrimental to you. So uh, team size, for example, the smaller the team, the easier is to uh, welcome new ideas and uh, to experiment faster boundaries, deciding who is inside the team and have more frequent uh, interaction from who is outside the roles. Roles uh, drive behavior. Think about how, for example, Scrum redefined traditional work roles in order to introduce new behaviors. But let me give you some tips about the tweaking control knobs. Don't do it like a sorcerer apprentice. Don't try to change everything at once and continuously. Because the system, in this case, our self-organizing team, our department have memory and disposition. And so every time that you do an experiment, regardless of not if that experiment works or fail, that influences the system. So first, start observing the forces at work in your self-organizing system, in your team. Try to develop situational awareness, also of the social aspect, what is going on. Then choose which experiment to run together with all the people that will be involved and affected by the experiment. Choose the experiment and enact the experiment together with the, all the team. And then use a trial and error approach. Remember, it is not possible to define a goal up front and tweak the knobs in order to achieve the desired effect. What will come? And the result is always unpredictable. If you are obtaining a result that works well for you, then you will amplify that change. If the result that you are getting instead is not beneficial, then you will revert that result. That's how you use uh, control knobs. So this is the philosophy. You amplify uh, what the changes that are beneficial, and then you dump down or revert the one that are not. 
Now, Joseph Berling introduced three more models, or at least I have uh, organized this work in three different models. Then there is the Ubide model from Dave Snowden and the C2 approach space from David Albert. That is a model that is not easy to find, but it is extremely uh, powerful. Let me share something with you. This is a wiki where you find many of the practices that I'm mentioning uh, available and described. And I want to share with you also a book that describes all the practices that I'm mentioning. And I'm giving you a special uh, uh, voucher for you. Let me go back to more practices. All the practices that I just described around human self-organization introduce uh, 20 odd control knobs that you can use to direct and influence self-organization. Now, I want to tell you something more. I don't know. Have you ever tried to introduce self-organization to your team and to your uh, organization? Let me know in the chat if you tried. Has it worked well or not? Was it difficult? What worked well? What didn't work? While you write in the chat, I'm going to tell you my own experience. I tried to introduce self-organization starting from the theory explaining people why it is important, explaining how it works and so on. But then I realized that most of the people learn better through real example and through hands-on practice. And so I'm starting and I started to take a different approach to the introduction of a complexity practice to teams and organization. Sorry, I jumped too quickly ahead. <laughs> I start to introduce uh, organization in a practical way, starting with the practices that are quite basic, using those practices to introduce the language of uh, complexity, human complexity, uh, while at the same time I show how it works and I can show how those practices are beneficial in everyday work. And then I gradually introduce a more advanced version of those practices. So just like the practices that I just introduced now, uh, they are listed and sorted from the more basic to the more advanced. And that's how the approach that I'm using now, a practical approach to introduce complexity. I quickly want to give you an overview of other practices now. The second region that I mentioned before is related to the work that we do. Now, while I was working in a Ferrari Formula One team, that was a fast paced environment with continuous change and a, a turbulent environment. But then other organizations face different problems that have different degrees of complexity. And so it became important to assess the degree of complexity that the team is facing in a certain moment and then adapt your way of working uh, to that degree of uh, complexity. What are the ingredients that make a system more complex or less complex? What are the elements that make a dynamic more complex or even chaotic or instead a simpler or just complicated ordered? Well, identified uh, some element, the technology. Sometimes uh, you are dealing with technology that no one ever used before or you have a, a lot of technical components connected together in a, in a very intricate way. And then, of course, people, the social relationship between co-workers, but also tech-savvy and hyper-connected customer. And then the third element is the work that we do, the domain and the requirements. 
Yes, we can have requirements that uh, sometimes are competing, are constantly changing, and these changes are accelerating. And sometimes we have a lot of new information to process. And think about people, our cr creativity that make us unpredictable. Sometimes we have goals that are misaligned, and sometimes we have conflicted interests. And the technology. How many times we have to deal with fragile integration of massive legacy code base and then uh, a technological ecosystem that is rapidly evolving. All these are potential sources of complexity. This scale introduces a practice to assess the degree of complexity, starting with the simple question of who in the world has done this before? And here you have five degrees of complexity. In green, things can be simple. In yellow or amber, things that are uh, complicated, ordered, but they need still need expert. To red, where they are really a high degree of complexity in the terminology of human complexity and kinabin. So League also suggests to tackle uh, the item with the degree of complexity and the capability uh, with the degree of complexity of four and five, because this is where you have the highest degree of uh, uh, risk that you want to tackle. This is where you will find out if your idea is feasible or not. And this is where usually there is the highest return on investment. So this is one practice to tackle, uh, to uh, assess the degree of complexity. But I have identified the four more practices, again, sorted from starting from the basic one uh, and then gradually to the more advanced one. Uh, so I want to remember a technique to introduce these practices is starting for the simple one show to the team that they are getting some real benefit and only after that introduce more advanced practice. In this way, uh, first you start to solve problem and then you introduce uh, uh, more of a good thing. So there you see sensing complexity, a practice that connect complexity to our human experience. Uh, consensus and uncertainty. Then you have complexity estimation and four-point method that are even more advanced practices. And then here there are four more practices that you can use to adapt your way of working to the degree of complexity. See two approach space by David Albert. It's really powerful, hard to find, but incredibly powerful. And then uh, uh, the more advanced that I'm, I'm using from a while is estimate accuracy, is a, a practice that allow us to adapt the strategy of investment and of development and delivery to the degree of complexity of the requirements and the technology that we are dealing with. Now, very quickly, uh, I will tell you a little more about the third region of uh, uh, complex, human complexity practices. And then we will move uh, to uh, Q&A. So please post your question on Q&A and upvote the question that you're interested in more. For example, I've read your comment about uh, not everyone wanting to work in a self-organized team. Please post your comment or your question there and vote them and we will discuss them uh, soon. As I mentioned before, there is a third region where organization may be complex. Now, there are two dynamics in human complexity that uh, are at the core of agile way of working. Those two dynamics are co-creation and co-evolution. Co-creation, it is like uh, drawing together in real time on the same canvas is about sharing our creative space together. It's like when you do pair programming or when you do ensemble programming, sometimes called mob programming. Co-evolution, again, is something that happened in Agile, is when the understanding of the problem and the discovery of a solution evolves end-in-end, -end, iteratively and gradually. One step, understanding of the problem, one step, 
discovery of a solution and so on. Those two dynamics are fundamental dynamics in a, an organization that is dealing with complexity. And co-creation is a collaborative pattern that is incredibly effective when dealing with complexity. Some organization is complex because it's bigger, because it has many uh, connections between people, because the technology is highly interconnected. That's the example that I made before with the several 10,000 of parts of a, a Formula One car. So organizations that have a complex structure are more susceptible to complex dynamic. But at the same time, those organizations have the power and the potential to better cope and also better exploit complexity. And in this area, I described the three different practice, practices. I can tell you that I use very often the culture affinity assessment. It is incredibly powerful and capture very well key element of uh, the company culture that are related both to complexity and both to agility and agile. And then the Lean Inception is another practice that it is extremely powerful and it's founded on co-creation of everyone involved in a delivery initiative. So the list is the origin of culture and making list is our attempt to make infinity comprehensible and to create order out of chaos. And so this is why after uh, experimenting, finding out uh, and writing down a set of practical application of complexity, I made the additional effort to create this catalog and organize the catalog in three regions. Okay. Again, we are complex team and human self-organization. The work we do may be complex. So complexity assessment and uh, adapting our way of working. And then the whole organization may be complex. Now, I want to give you again one last time the reference to the wiki where you can look out uh, uh, the different practice and uh, uh, the ebook with the complete catalog. But most of all, I would like to switch to the Q&A and see if you have any questions. I give you some time to write questions, but uh, while you write down question and uh, while you uh, upvote the question, I will start from the comment that not everyone wants to work in a self-organized team. Uh, yes, that is true. Uh, well, there are two sides of it is what you mean with self-organization. There are, uh, in human self-organization, the first step is not to uh, block or uh, prevent the spontaneous self-organization. Let people talk with each other, let people interact with each other, also about the work. If you don't allow those doing the work to talk about their way of working, to talk about their process, to talk about how to improve their way of working, to talk about what is working and what not, those conversations will happen anyway, maybe at the coffee machine. They will turn into gossip and they will become detrimental. So allow people to interact, to think, but also give them some degree of autonomy. Now we can move from self-organization to self-management, where not only you allow and support the self-organization, but also give a lot of authority to, to the team member in order to uh, organize the work that they are doing and decide how to do that. And someone can be more or less uh, comfortable with that. Again, you can start gradually. Look at the uh, control knob. You can start with a smaller team. 
you can uh, have boundaries that are more uh, defined or less defined. You can assign role that better uh, define the work that someone is supposed to do, and then gradually make those roles less clear and give people more freedom. The lesson here is to use a gradual approach to that, a practical approach. Start with something small and uh, try to make it work so that people can see the benefit of it and then they can ask more. Now we have uh, uh, another uh, question. Uh, let's call those asking the question uh, into video. Bernard, do you want to go with your question? Uh, yeah, I, I was trying to. Uh, yeah, I can. I, I was just reacting to your, the onion you show. You show so uh, with the different uh, level of area of complexity, and my question is, of, of course, uh, if you have sometimes, as you mentioned, the work is not always complex. So, but behind that, you have a team, and by definition, if I understand, that it's always complex. Yeah. So, does it mean that? Everything is always complex and as I have to deal, we have to manage that as a complex system in all cases, because at the end, we always have people, we have always have teams who have to interact. And so we have complexity. So that's the conclusion I, I do following the explanation. Is it, what do yeah. you think about that? that? That's a very interesting point. So what you say is true and there is more to that. We people are always complex. Our interactions are always complex. And uh, the way that we interact is always non-linear. Think about when someone has an unexpected reaction to what you say, a positive, unexpected, or a negative. But then one of the practices that I introduce about assessing the degree of complexity of a delivery initiative take into account the three elements of complexity, three sources. And I'm just giving you an example, any practices uh, that uh, can be used to assess the degree of complexity will do here. So we have the people side of complexity, we have the technology side of complexity, and the domain side of complexity. And they all contribute to create a different degree of complexity. So let's go again, uh, let's focus again on people. You can have a team that work together for a long time that uh, are used to the, uh, an established way of working among themselves and they are working with customers and clients that they know very well. Yes, there is still a degree of complexity, but this degree of complexity is less than another team where everyone is new when no one ever worked together using this way of working and where even the customers and the client are new. In that case, the degree of complexity is higher. So it is not about just are we complex or are we not complex, but this is about a different degree of complexity. And uh, through different degree of complexity, you have different way of working. Let me give you another example or quickly. The C2 model, for example, suggests that as much as the degree of complexity increases, the more is beneficial to have informal collaboration pa uh, pattern to allow, for example, that you don't have to go to someone else manager in order to talk with that person or that you don't have to ask permission to uh, do something then uh, the more complexity, uh, the more important is information sharing, transparent information sharing, and you can have different degree. And the more complexity you have, the more important is to delegate the decision autonomy to the team. So you have like marina group that are uh, conducting an operation on the field that they have a full autonomy. And then you have, for example, scrum team that they have a lot of autonomy, but still, for example, the priorities are defined by the customer and the PMO and so on. So you see different degree of complexity, different degree of agility needed and beneficial. So it's a range, not a, a on off. And a, thank you for giving me the opportunity to explain this important thank concept. Thank you for the explanation. That was really clear. 
Let's what a question. Bring in, uh, someone else. Uh, 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 Alexander, I will try to invite you to jump on stage. Um, uh, Alexander, Alexander, yep, if you invite on stage. So, Alexander, can you tell me about your question? So, yep. Welcome, Alexander. Yes, thank you. Uh, yes, my question was about uh, when you have a, a, a team uh, in which uh, some team members just uh, want to provide their part of the work and not being in the co-creation of the big picture, uh, what kind of leverage do you have on this? So, l let me... I'm not going to give you an answer because uh, uh, I will need to be a magician or I will need to be extremely arrogant to know the, the answer to this question. But uh, let, let me share with you my thought. In my experience, I noticed uh, the two sides of this problem. Sometimes is a uh, people personality. Everyone has their own personality and sometimes is also emotional maturity. Yes, we human beings are social beings. We naturally have social interaction, but some of us is as emotionally more mature and is more capable to have a more profitable social interaction. Others uh, have dysfunctional social interaction or are just less good, or there is cognitive diversity. In that case, I will adapt the interaction style to, to their ability. And I will try to say, OK, you can still focus on your work, but you need to accept feedback and understand how your work is impacting others, how wh which work is working, and which of your actions are not working. So at least you have to welcome some tangible, uh, factual feedback and to enact on that. So I will try to engage them with the interaction in a way that is uh, um, comfortable to them, maybe less emotional, maybe less social, maybe more factual, but still allow an interaction with the others. Because the complexity is not about the agents, but it is about the messy magic that happened in the interaction. And so I will adapt the style of interaction. The second element that someone want to look at may want to look at their task because they're they're just pissed off by the system they see that every time that they try to look at the big picture someone is telling them do your job and and uh, don't look around i will not fix your problem uh, another time there is someone that really is not a good fit in their professional journey they're not in the right place to do a good job but Alex, uh, Alexander, tell me more. This is my experience. What are your thoughts? Well, uh, we, we we used to 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 work quite a lot with uh, external people. Uh, so we we pay them uh, for doing the job, and that's it. Uh, and it's, it's always difficult with external people uh, to really. Uh, help them to embrace the big picture and the the, the, the business impact and the, the strategy and so on. Uh, and it's always difficult to find a way to really um, uh, uh, make them really uh, involved uh, in the global picture and not only in this uh, in this part but uh, I, I like your, your tips regarding the, the factual part uh, because as you said, they're not necessarily into the emotional part and as they are not really uh, within the company. Uh, so I, I guess I will try to, 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 to figure out with, uh, with more factual uh, elements. Another thing that, uh, uh, other two things. One is many companies now uh, do a cultural fit with the people that they hire or work with. Uh, they look at people that from a social point of view they have that skill and instead another practice i use lean inception so when i start an initiative i bring everyone together to co-create uh, the picture of what we are going to build it's 
the effort of communicating a vision that has been defined up front is incredible. It is 10 times easier to invite everyone and then co-create that vision, letting everyone contribute. So that vision becomes everyone's vision. And the, I know that many organizations try to save time inviting only few representatives. I always fight to get everyone that will work on that initiative together. And when you build that vision together, you are more invested in participating into the big picture. Thank Thanks, you very much, Alexander. I invited Cedric uh, to jump on scene to elaborate a little bit uh, his question. Yes, please. Yep, he's joining. And Alexander, I see Heaves that is uh, uh, posting a comment on the chat. Feel free to interact with him uh, about uh, your question. I think Heaves uh, have a very interesting comment there for you. So Hello. Can you, can you, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, hang on. Thank you. Uh, just one question about um, uh, you, you, uh, you talked uh, about um, the complexity and you said you have to, to consider um, the software or the I mean, our team or what we do as a complex system. But what, what we do um, every day is uh, like uh, we try to divide this uh, complex system into a small uh, small part, like simple, simple things. Uh, but um, my uh, my question is about no estimate. Uh, it's like you said that like, uh, uh, we are maybe uh, I'm, I'm not I don't know a lot about no estimate, but it's like it sounds to me like it's a failure that we we cannot um, estimate the complexity of the system or what we're going to do. So we say we don't estimate, so there's no predictability for that, and we're fine with that. Let's uh, let's move on. What do you think of no estimate? Yeah, that's a, that's an interesting question. Uh, and uh, let me tell you two things uh, that uh, can be interesting. Uh, when we talk about technical practices, many technical practices, uh, uh, for example, when we look at extreme programming, are about moving things from the complex and ordered to the complicated, so ordered system. And when we do automation, we even move things from the complicated to the simple. So that's the, the more technical part. And uh, even if you look at the book Accelerate about continuous delivery, you see uh, that the author make the distinction between product development and the creative part of our work compared to the technical part that often we tend to move from complex to complicated and even with the automation through simple. When we are looking with a feature to work and products, we are in the complex. So your question is uh, absolutely pertinent. But there is something about a no estimate that many people forget or simply don't know uh, because, you know, the no estimate name is provocative. But yes, no estimate, uh, maybe do not estimate the size uh, in story points, but you have to break down story in smaller chunks. For example, one acceptance test per story. And when the team discuss, because beware, the team need to discuss those user stories in order to split them, they discuss what do we have to test? What is that acceptance test? What does it mean? So can we break that acceptance test even more and make it smaller? So that conversation, I'd like uh, different opinions. If you disagree, you see, you don't disagree about story point and now you disagree about how you split uh, stories. Uh, or you see, I don't understand how to do this, how to test this or how to implement it. So no estimate, shift the conversation from the sides to the splitting, but you still need to have that conversation and that conversation will eventually highlight ambiguities, uncertainty and misunderstandings that need to be tackled. So I think if, if you 
shift the conversation from story point to splitting, you can still address the complexity and surface the hidden complexity of user story. I would never suggest that you skip the conversation at all. Does this make sense to you, Cedric? Do you have any thought about that? No, that's pretty clear answer. That's correct. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Do we have time for another question or should we move on? We we still have some time, so I don't know if, if uh, people have still some questions. Do not hesitate. Uh, I can uh, invite you on, on stage uh, straight away. Is, uh, I saw you have a comment uh, to Alexander if you want to jump on video and uh, try to tell something to Alexander and maybe if you can bring also so Alexander back. And let's Eve, see. I will invite you on stage uh, to provide a uh, live reaction. Hi, Eve. Do you want to say something more? I see you were chatting uh, to Alexander about the initial question. Yeah, the the the, the thing is, I, I do understand. I, I think I partially understand where, where he's coming from. But for me, the thing was, um, it depends really on how we treat internals and externals. And what I see is that if we treat them in the same way, uh, then you, I think you actually get the people, um, the, the right externals. Um, if you treat them differently, and some companies do that uh, um, for, for some legal reasons, I, I know there are some really legal reasons too, to make it different, but we can still minimize that, the, the legal part. And once we do that, once we keep them, uh, treat them in, in a similar way, I, I feel that we have at least the same kind of interactions and the same kind of, um, yeah, the same kind of things that uh, people, um, that I think he was looking for. Um, yeah, if you, you are making me think about one of the uh, control knobs that Joseph Perlin described, but that is the boundaries. So basically what you're suggesting to use the language of that practice, you are redefining the boundaries between internal and external co-workers in order to invite them in an environment that is more conductive to a good collaboration good social and work collaboration yeah it, it, i think that's it joseph is, is yeah is, is a smart guy he knows to to say it much better than than i and than i would yeah it's so, about his boundaries I agree yeah I'm, I'm just bringing i'm just bringing uh, uh using the terminology boundaries because uh, uh is the reason in that you share it is how you use those um control knobs those are reflection points on things that you can tweak in a way that you just describe it. They are not mechanical things like on a radio or on a machine, are human things like you describe it. The, the control knobs that Joseph Perlin described are just starting point where we can start to think about the things that you just described. So yes, I use a different language, but just to say those are connected and the right language is the one that you were using is. Yeah, thanks. Well, I, I see that Alexander is already responding that, um, yeah, so I'm not sure if he's coming back on stage or not. But yeah, I, I think this is, it, there, there's a lot that could help there. Um, yeah, so the practical suggestion that come out from this interaction is have a look at the different control knobs. Think about which impact do you have, which problem do you have, and maybe in one of those control knobs, uh, you can think, oh, this could help. But beware, uh, acting on the control knobs will not automatically give you the goal that you have defined up front. You have to observe the result and then amplify or revert if it doesn't work. Alexander, please share your thought. You are on stage. You are on mute now, Alexander. If, if you want to yeah, say- Yeah, sorry. Go. Sorry. Uh, yes, just to 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 follow what uh, Eve uh, just said. I think yes, uh, we we have a, 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 an approach in terms of uh, customer supplier that is really 
too focused uh, on, on the delivery and the work uh, and not on the global approach and working as a team. Uh, and I think it's, it's an interesting topic. I, I, should, uh, I should go uh, and talk with some people internally on this, on this approach uh, that, that should be improved, yeah. And I, but the, I good news is that yeah. you, the good news is that you, you basically have the control over it, because if you yeah. say that there is some internal way of, of dealing with it, then you have some, that's much easier to deal with than, than changing lots of other external people on how they behave. So Absolutely. it might be, yeah. might be worth it. Yeah, and I can also see, uh, uh, I, I, I don't work with, uh, a lot of teams, uh, something like uh, uh, 10 teams currently, but uh, um, I, I can see also a difference between um, externals coming from uh, North America and from Europe. Uh, and we can see that for North America, this is really focused on the delivery and uh, the, I, I guess the company of the supplier uh, is really oriented this way. Uh, and maybe we shall, uh, we shall uh, also talk with them uh, on, on, on the approach and the relationship we have with them uh, to, to improve it. Yeah. Something from a conceptual point of view, again, I'm, I'm trying to connect some theory to the beautiful conversation that you are having. I, I find it incredibly interesting, the question and the conversation. What human complexity is telling us that the separation between the delivery and the technology, the domain and the people is artificial those three elements are interconnected and the way that we treat people and the boundaries that we define have an impact on the delivery whether it is the domain and the technology those boundaries are transcended and those elements are intrinsically connected so hr you cannot break the system down in pieces and treat each piece differently you have to realize that every element influences every other element just like you beautifully describe it now okay i think uh, we if there is no more question, I propose to end the session. So thank you very much, uh, Luca, for uh, all the light you gave on, on this uh, really exciting topic, complexity. Uh, thank you for the participant. And uh, so we will have a lunch break and uh, we start again the, the next session at one o'clock. So you have all the details on uh, in Air Meets and all uh, also on the uh, website thank you very much thank you everyone bye yep uh, i have just last message uh, we will do a speed networking no so if you want to connect to the people inside the conference you have the opportunity to join the speed networking so it's uh, random uh, based on your profile the system will invite you to chat to chat for a very brief uh, moment with someone else uh, who are also attending this conference. Thank you very much and see you this afternoon or in the speed uh, dating uh, system in a minute. Bye-bye. Thank you, Benoit. Thank you. Bye-bye.